Hi everybody, my name is Mr Barlow. Welcome to episode 28 of the VCE Biology Podcast. This episode covers part of Unit 3, Area of Study 2, and I'll be talking about the endocrine system and how this system helps organisms coordinate and regulate the way they function by using hormones. I'll also be talking about homeostasis and some of the major plant hormones. So this episode's about the way the endocrine system regulates the body and helps the body maintain a constant internal environment. So it's important to state straight off that if the body doesn't maintain a normal state, for example, it gets too hot or it gets too cold, it'll die. So a human, if it gets, a human gets too hot or a human gets too cold, it'll die. And that happens with lots of variables in the body. So it's really important that we maintain a very constant internal environment. And the endocrine system helps us do that. So if you wanted to, you could throw on your bathers, go down to the beach and lie in the sun on a 40 degree day and it'd be hot. Or if you really wanted to, you could throw on your bathers, go up to the snow and lie in the snow on a zero degree day and it'd be pretty cold. So you can see that the external environment of a person can vary greatly, and that example is temperature. But importantly, the cells in a person require a really stable internal environment for them to function normally. So this stable internal environment, which is maintained within really narrow limits, is called homeostasis. Now all of the cells of your body have got a fluid in them. It's called the cytosol. And all the fluid in a cell is called the cell's intracellular fluid. Cells are also surrounded by fluid. All the fluid outside of a cell is called the cell's extracellular fluid. For example, blood cells are submerged in a fluid called blood plasma. Now materials are constantly being exchanged between the liquid inside the cell, the intracellular fluid, and the liquid surrounding the cell, the extracellular fluid. For example, glucose and oxygen, nutrients, things like that, are often going from the outside of the cell into a cell. And cell waste products like carbon dioxide are often leaving a cell. Now because materials are always exchanging between the insides of cells and the tissue fluid surrounding cells and the plasma and the blood, the level of a substance in one fluid, so for example the blood, can tell us a bit about what's happening in the cells of the body. Because blood is pretty easy to get out of a person, Doing a blood test can tell us heaps about the state of cells in other parts of the body. And that's often why when you're sick, your doctor says, you need a blood test. Now it's absolutely critical that the cells and the fluids in our body are maintained within really narrow limits via homeostasis. And the variables that are controlled via homeostasis are things like the level of nutrients in our body, the temperature of our body, the level of water, the levels of various salts and minerals, the pH or how acidic and basic we are, our blood volume is very precise, the blood pressure, uh, the level of oxygen in our body, the level of carbon dioxide in our body, and the number of red blood cells. So all these variables are constantly monitored in the body. And whenever a change is detected, so whenever things change from their normal narrow limits, various body systems react to restore the balance. So that's what homeostasis is. So restoring balance to the body in one of those variables normally occurs via a negative feedback system. So what happens in negative feedback is that when a change is detected in one variable, an action occurs to produce a change in the opposite direction. For, so for example, if we're too hot, something will happen to make us colder. If we're too cold, we might shiver to get warmer. If we don't have enough water in our bodies, we might drink to get more water. Uh, if we don't have enough oxygen, we'll breathe more to get more oxygen in. If we've got too much carbon dioxide, we'll breathe more to get more carbon dioxide out. So heaps of different variables are controlled within really narrow limits. So as I said, negative feedback helps to maintain homeostasis. And the two systems that coordinate all the functions of the body and are also actively involved in maintaining homeostasis are the endocrine system, which is a system composed of hormones and glands, and the nervous system, which is composed of special uh, nerve cells called neurons. A good example of hormones maintaining homeostasis via a negative feedback mechanism is the way that blood glucose is controlled by two hormones called insulin and glucagon. 
So insulin works by making all the cells of the body take up more glucose from the blood. And when the liver takes up more glucose from the blood, it stores the glucose as glycogen. And the second hormone, glucagon, it works by acting on the liver to make the liver release more glucose into the blood. So it makes the liver turn glycogen into glucose, which is then released into the blood. And these two hormones, insulin and glucagon, they work together to maintain homeostatic levels of blood glucose. So for example, if blood glucose levels fall below their normal level, some special cells called alpha cells in the pancreas increase the production of the hormone glucagon. So this acts on the liver to convert glycogen into glucose, so that results in blood glucose levels increasing. But also, some other special cells called beta cells decrease their production of insulin. And so less insulin in the blood means that less glucose is taken up by the body's cells. So this decrease in the level of insulin, combined with the increase in the level of glucagon, works to increase the level of blood glucose in the body. So conversely, if the level of blood glucose is too high, the pancreas increases its production of the hormone insulin, and that makes the body cells take up more glucose from the blood, and the hormone glucagon is reduced so that the liver releases less glucose into the blood. And both of those things work to end up reducing the level of blood glucose. So you can see how those two hormones, insulin and glucagon, both work together to maintain levels of blood glucose at a very steady state. And that's a really good example of hormones working to achieve homeostasis via negative feedback. Although most hormones operate by a negative feedback system, there are some rare positive feedback systems in the body. Now the best example of positive feedback is childbirth or the hormones involved in childbirth. So the hormone oxytocin is produced by the pituitary gland during childbirth and it works to help the uterus contract and the uterus contracting helps to push the baby out of the uterus. So oxytocin is in the blood and it works to push the baby out but it also acts on the pituitary gland and stimulates the pituitary gland to release more oxytocin. So oxytocin in the blood stimulates the pituitary to release more oxytocin. When more oxytocin is released, the uterus has bigger contraction, so this is, you know, labour. And then when that happens, more oxytocin is released, and then that stimulates bigger labour contractions, and then that also stimulates more oxytocin to be released, and you can see this positive feedback where the level of oxytocin in the blood increases and increases and increases and it results in the uterus contracting and contracting and contracting until the baby is born. And so the hormones involved in childbirth is one of those few examples of a positive feedback system. So obviously, it's important for cells in an organism to be able to communicate with each other to help control that organism. Now communication can occur either chemically or electrically, and the molecules that enable cells to communicate are called signalling molecules. So the signalling molecules we've been talking about are the chemical messages called hormones which are produced by the endocrine system. Now there are three types of hormones, there's amino acid derivatives and peptide and protein hormones and steroid hormones. So steroid hormones have a lipid or fat base. As a result they're lipophilic which means fat loving. Because they're lipophilic they can diffuse through the phospholipid bilayer of cells and also because they're lipophilic they're insoluble in water. So when steroid hormones travel in the bloodstream, they require a carrier protein for transport. So although steroid hormones require a carrier protein to be transported in the blood, they are capable of passing straight through the cell membrane to, to deliver their message. On the other hand, amino acid derivative hormones and protein and peptide hormones are hydrophilic, which means water-loving, so they're water soluble, so they can dissolve in the blood and require no assistance to travel in the bloodstream. 
unfortunately, they're unable to pass through the phospholipid bilayer of cells without some assistance. So these water-soluble hormones require the presence of a second messenger molecule to transmit the message from the surface membrane of the cell into the cytosol of the cell. So when these water-soluble hormones communicate with receptors on the surface of the cell, the receptors then activate another protein, for example, a G protein within the cytosol of that cell. So G proteins or guanine nucleotide binding proteins, function as molecular switches and are involved in things called second messenger cascades. So when the G or other proteins are activated in the cytosol, or when steroid hormones dissolve through the plasma membrane into the cytosol, the cell converts one kind of signal into another by a series of relay molecules and other proteins. And this process, in which the cell converts one kind of signal into another, is called signal transduction. Within a cell, signal transduction amplifies the signal that the original hormone molecule brought to the cell. A signal brought by a single individual hormone molecule, or even a few hormone molecules, can be amplified to induce reactions that involve many substrates and make many things happen within the cell. So when hormones have delivered their signal to the target cells and the desired effectors have taken place, they're no longer required. So they don't just hang around the body forever, the hormones are degraded by cell enzymes and end up being excreted via the kidneys or in your poo. So they don't last indefinitely. They end up being broken down by the body. Another group of chemical signaling molecules used by animals are pheromones. Pheromones are released by one animal and are used to communicate with another animal of the exact same species. So importantly, pheromones are species specific. For example, they're often used as sex attractants. So a male insect will only respond to a pheromone released by a female insect of the exact same species. Interestingly, artificial pheromone molecules can be made in the lab and these mimic the effects of the real pheromone molecules. And that's useful for people who grow crops and things like that because it can help reduce the amount of pest infestation of crops. Now, I've spent the majority of this podcast talking about the endocrine system in animals. But plants are organisms too. And plants undergo a great deal of growth and development during their life cycle. So for the rest of this podcast, I'm going to talk about the way that hormones coordinate and regulate plant growth and development. So plant hormones are carried around a plant by the xylem and the phloem. Xylem and the phloem are the transport structures of plants. Xylem also carries water and phloem also carries sugars. At the cell level, plant hormones result in a signal transduction pathway that's very similar to the way that animal cells work. Plant hormones are produced mainly in the cells of growing regions of shoots and roots. These are called meristems. They're also produced in young leaves, in growing seeds and in developing fruit. Now plant hormones can be classified into five different groups. There's auxins, cytokinins, gibberellins, abscisic acid, and ethylene. So auxins stimulate the elongation of cells in stems. They also stimulate the growth of lateral roots. They promote the growth of flowers and fruits. So they're mainly involved in growth, but they can also influence cells to differentiate into other cells. Now auxins are produced in the growing tips of plants. And one particular auxin, a hormone called IAA, is responsible for apical dominance. And apical dominance is where one stem grows bigger and stronger than all the other stems of the plant. More often than not, that one big strong stem ends up being the trunk. Auxins are also involved in plant tropisms. So a tropism is when a plant grows in response to a stimulus. So for example, when a plant grows in response to light, it shows phototropism. And what happens then is auxins move to the dark side of the plant, make those cells elongate so that the plant bends towards the light. Auxins are also responsible for geotropism. 
So when roots grow down towards gravity, that's called positive geotropism. And when stems grow up away from gravity, that's called negative geotropism. Cytokinins are another class of growth promoting hormones and they act on shoots, roots and fruits. <laughs> Poet and you didn't even know it. And this class of hormone promotes cell reproduction. The next class of plant hormones is gibberellins. So gibberellins promote plant growth by stimulating both cell elongation and cell reproduction. Gibberellins also initiate seed germination and bud development. Abscisic acid is a growth inhibiting hormone, so it's responsible for the dropping of fruit and, for example, leaves falling off trees in autumn. And it also controls stomatal opening and closing, so those little holes in the bottom of leaves where gas exchange takes place. So the last class of plant hormone which helps control plants is ethylene, which is a gas. And ethylene results in fruit ripening, so it increases cellular respiration and it converts starch and oil into sugar. And so a good example of ethylene is if you put some really ripe bananas in a bag with some unripe fruit, the ripe bananas will, will release the ethylene gas and make the unripe fruit ripe. So that's what the hormone does. It helps ripen fruit. And that brings episode 28 of the VCE Biology podcast to a close. I'm Mr Barlow, and thanks for listening.